Hi there and welcome to today's episode of Lumix Nordic YouTube channel. Um, today we're going to talk about time lapse, Sebastian, wasn't it? Yes. Right. So, so we're going to talk we about... have a little. Sorry. <laughs> Please go on. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So we have a little schedule here. Schedule here today. It's uh, um, what cameras uh, can do time lapse, and what do I need to set up a time lapse shooting. Um, what do I need for it, uh, for instance, uh, tripods and stuff, uh, and how do I set it up for the uh, Lumix S series primarily, um, and different things to think about to get it right. Um, so where should we start, Sebastian? Should we start with um, what cameras we have time lapse on? That's an easy yeah, one. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> an easy one. Uh, even I know that one. If it says Lumix on it, it will have a time lapse mode. Yes. So that's it's, great. It's um, yeah, and that's something I've loved with the Lumix cameras for so many years. Um, it hasn't been there always, though. I no. think the GH2, for instance, which was one of the first cameras I was operating, it didn't have time lapse. But from a certain time, there was time lapse on all cameras. And that also applies to the very least expensive cameras like the TZ90, for instance. So um, that's that's really wonderful. Um, if, if you're having any issues with our stream today here, just let us know in the comments. Um, we got a, a comment here from YouTube now that it doesn't receive enough uh, stream. So you might get some buffering there, but hope it's working out for you. So anyway, um, it's quite so, easy to so work. I don't need to have a special camera. I can pick up no. any Lumix camera, uh, yes. even the cheaper ones. So this is really a, a very good, if you happen to be a bit stuck at home, <laughs> it's a great yeah. project <laughs> to set up a small time lapse. Yeah, because it, it's quite kind of time consuming at times if you do, especially if you do stop motion. And so if you yeah. want to really kill some time, then just go ahead and, and start shooting time lapse or stop motion because that's really worthwhile. Also, time lapse, of course, takes quite a lot of time because you need to capture a lot of frames in a much longer time. That's what time lapse, time lapse is about. So maybe I should just first clear up the two subjects here, stop motion and time lapse, because we're primarily going to talk about um, time lapse, but also a little bit about stop motion. So we got we from We have a um, comment about the sync yeah. in the audio, Martin. Right. So uh, it's we not had quite some in sync. Yeah, we had some issues here today with the uh, the software. So uh, we apologize if there's not great sync, but we hope it's not too bad. Can you check that in some way, Sebastian, or how does that mm, work? Can you see I'll it on check. the stream itself? Maybe uh, we difficult. might get some double sound for a short while. He says it looks good and it sounds good, so just not synced. So, okay. I don't think there's so much we can do about it <laughs> at the moment. So anyway, um, I'm going to just uh, take a little short briefing on what time-lapse is and what you can do with it. So time-lapse is a way of capturing pictures in set intervals so that you later can compose a, a video out of it uh, and the video will have a much higher speed of everything that happens in the picture because you shot just snapshots of what happened in time and then you um, play that back in 25 frames per second for instance so um, then there's the stop motion uh, and the difference is that you you control the exposures, the, the takes, uh, when you want to take them. So essentially that's when you animate things, um, you want to control when you take the picture, but with time lapse it's a certain time that lapses between each frame. And that can be different timing as well. So first off, what do I need to set this up? And quite obviously it's quite good to have something sturdy to put your camera on. If that's a tripod or a uh, one of those um, 
what do you call it? Gorilla pods. Yeah. So um, <laughs> <laughs> that's a great one. Um, and any kind of support. I, I've even made time lapse with I think that was the T set one hundred from a window in Norway um, where I just happened to see a very stunning morning sunrise and I put my camera on my wallet <laughs> so anything works if you get your camera steady up um, and it doesn't move too much then it works so right. I just kind of slanted it, it to, to, towards the really window. have to be as stable say as for uh, a long exposure photography because the right. shutter time will well most of the time be relatively short yeah so besides the tripod you might want to have that's that's something that you doesn't you don't really need it but you you might want to have a um, a slider there are motorized yeah. sliders that can do motion for you uh, but that's quite much more advanced so if you have a tripod you're pretty much good to go um, you might want to have um, a, a power bank so you can connect to your Lumix S series the S series have the possibility to use USB-C for powering and also during the shot so that is special for for the Lumix S series uh, you can do that on the G9 as well by the way so you can charge it during your shot so I think that's that's pretty much what you need to get up and running and you, of course you need a lens so what lens do I do I want to have if you're on a, a compact camera you're confined to what you have on there but um, uh, most of the time I would say that using a wide-angle lens is quite preferable um, the reason for it is if you shoot a high resolution you can always crop in but of course it's always very nice to have some you can have macros in your time-lapse you can have super tele um, when you shoot the moon for instance when it rises then you have a telephoto of course so any range will do for your shot depending on your your scene of course but you can crop in quite a lot uh, yes, you can. what yeah. you essentially get is a video at the full resolu resolution of what the camera can actually take stills of. Yeah, exactly. Um, also, actually using a fisheye lens is really quite worthwhile in some cases. Um, and I'm going to come to that later, um, why that can be interesting. I'm going to try to remember that. So. Uh, so now we're going to talk about how to set this up. That's maybe a little threshold for some people to get get working with stop motion or time lapse. Um, most of the time, in, in many other cameras from other manufacturers, you need a a time lapse timer or intervalometer that we call it that you hook up to your camera externally. But with, um, with all the Lumix cameras, you have this built in, and it's a, it's a really great timer that is built in. And I'm going to show that here on screen. So um, in the camera, there is an intervalometer uh, built inside. So you get this in your menu. I'm going to remove you, Sebastian, for a moment. Sorry about Please that. Please do. There we go. So in the menu, on the this is the S1 Edge I'm holding right now. Um, you get the menu on um, photography and under others. So there's the time lapse animation men menu. So first of all, you select time lapse or stop motion animation. And like I said earlier, the big difference is if you want to have timed exposures or just manually. There's also one different there uh, that could be good to know, though. If you choose stop motion here, you will also have the possibility of, of uh, using, seeing the other frames that you shot previously. So you can uh, aim your subject um, in a good way. So you, you have like a, an onion skin. You can see kind of uh, ghost pictures of the previous ones that you would not get from time lapse shot. So in the menu here, you choose time-lapse shot, shooting interval setting on, 
And that's a setting that is quite uh, special, really. It's, um, it's only in the Lumix S series, so that's a feature that's not in the, uh, the other cameras. Shooting interval setting will um, set either uh, an interval or not, right? So what that means is that when one picture is being shot, it will take the next picture immediately, as soon as possible for the camera. So the camera takes a picture, it saves it to the cars and then takes the other one. That means if you're shooting with a very long exposure, for instance, it's going to be a very long interval between the pictures um, because it's just uh, it's saving the picture and then it takes another one. Um, so it's automatically uh, being a, a very long um, interval. So most of the time you would probably want to have this on, the interval setting, but the reason for having it is if you, uh, if you want to, for instance, um, capture a sunrise and you want the, um, the, the motion, the, the flow in the picture to be quite slow uh, when, it, when the day comes and it will be a bit faster during the night time because it takes longer time between. So long time between exposures is the same as a fast speed in your picture. In the, in the motion. So, um, next thing here is start time. This is very uh, nice feature if you don't want to wake up in the middle of the night to get your camera up and running. You can just set it for now or start a time s at a different time set. So, if you want it to start at 5 o'clock at night, just put 5 in here and it will wake up and it will start up. So right. one question um, there, uh, Martin. Yeah. Do I need? Should I just let the camera fall asleep in rest mode, or can I sh actually shut it off? Uh, no, you should not shut it off really, no. because when when you um, activate time lapse and start it up, it's going to go to sleep immediately. So the camera will okay. do that itself. And I was it's going actually to ask not, you about so, that, if I have a very long interval between shots as well, the camera will actually fall asleep then, right? It will, yeah. yeah. It will um, decide that uh, upon how long the intervals is. So, if, for instance, I think there's, I think it's 30 seconds or so. But if the intervals is larger than 30 seconds, it will go to sleep between them for convenience. Um, so anyway, an um, a image count can be set here. Um, you have the, this is the, the actual timer. This is the same timer that you, we have in all the cameras. So this is going to look the same. So except for the other features that I showed earlier, this is going to be the same. So here you can set the image count, and that can be up to 9,999. And here is a little tip uh, that I've learned the hard way. Uh, if you think about shooting 500 pictures, for instance, and you're not really sure that it's going to uh, be enough pictures with 500, put something else here. Put 1500 or 2500 or even 9500, because you can always shut it off when you're ready, uh, when, it, when it's done. And of course, if it's doing it by itself at night, then it's more important to have this set up correctly. So the shooting intervals, that's the time between each shot. And that can be set up to 99 minutes, 99 seconds, I think. Or no, probably 60 seconds, 59. <laughs> so um, if you set one second here, it's going to take one second between each shot. One really little nifty feature here. If you look at the bottom here of the menu, it says 11.53 3rd of June 2020. So if I go in here and I set a one minute uh, interval instead, it's going to say 2012, 12 past 20 in, in the same day. And if I put a much longer interval here, you can see that it's going to be on the 7th of June instead. So that's, that's super convenient. This is actually 
one of those things things that is quite difficult to um, to set up uh, and and know when it's going to end. You have to bring up your calculator probably, um, but you don't so need that here. So does this take into account the starting time as well? Um, I think so. I'm not sure. We can check that here. So it says now 11.54 and if we take a start time of 5 o'clock yes, it's going to say 5.08 there. So yeah, it yeah. takes the start time as well. So that, that's super great. That was a good question, Sebastian. I didn't really yeah. think Every of that Every once before. in a while I get them right. <laughs> great. So um, lastly here, the last thing you can set up in your menu here, and this is also specific for the S1 series. And this is something that I'm really excited about, and that's exposure leveling. The reason why I'm so excited about this is that this is also a feature that normally, uh, in terms of time-lapse photography, this would be called uh, Holy Grail time-lapsing. So holy grail time lapse, time lapsing. That's when you go from from uh, uh, in the nighttime to daytime, or from daytime to nighttime, but you do it without having any flickering at all. And that is really difficult for any camera to to master, because normally you have this uh, third stop exposure jumps that makes the, the video very, very flickery. And it's kind of undecisive. So what it does here in the S1 series is that it kind of measures the exposure like a video camera would do it. And it sets the exposure very exactly. And that's also working for any long exposure. So you can have like 60 seconds and it will uh, do 59, 0.5 seconds, 59 seconds, etc. So it's going to micro adjust to any light changes. And this is quite unique feature. I haven't seen any camera that can do this at the same time as it actually outputs raw images. So that's really nice. I, I know some um, time lapsers who use very expensive equipment like um, a small computer connected to the camera just to be doing that with a light meter and stuff like that. So anyway, that's, um, that's part of how you set up the inner menu there. When you're done with this, when everything is, is ready, set up there in the menu, um, you go back to your shooting screen. And then it depends a little bit on what camera you have, but now we're talking about the S-series. So with the S-series, you have the, the mode dial here. And underneath it, right here, you have a little dial uh, that goes around the mode dial, which is the drive selector. And at the very end of it, there's two things that looks like a clock or a timer. The last one is um, self-timer, when you put it on a tripod and take your selfie. Uh, but the one before it is the time-lapse feature. So as, as you can see here on the screen, when I turn this over to time lapse, there will be a, a small information on the screen that says start time now, and it disappears after a few seconds. So if I would go ahead now and just take a picture, it will be in time lapse mode and shoot each second. Just like that. And if I want to end it, I can just turn the camera off, or I can uh, um, just press Q button, or I can also put the dial to something else and it will just shut down. So another thing that might be interesting is now to um, see what happens when I have shot my series. So what happens after that? So let's take a look at that. All right. Um, oh, sorry, Sebastian, I'm going to remove you here. There you go. Um, about it. So what comes up here, if we play it back here on the card, is a series of pictures. So up with the Lumix logo there, it says 14 pictures. Now, what I can do here is um, to play this back as a image series. 
Let's see here. I don't okay. know if your sound is cutting out, Martin, or if it's just a sound to me. Please tell us if you're okay. having any issues in chat. Right. Yeah, it seems like I'm moving on the meter, but I don't hear myself. <laughs> so, um, so here you can actually step forward in your picture stack. So it's kind of stacking the images into uh, a thumbnail which says how many pictures you have in that stack. And if you press uh, on, on the camera, you, uh, you can press uh, arrow down on the selector at the back to go into that stack. So you can move between the pictures with the arrows left and right. So you can check your, your images if they are sharp enough. You can um, play it back by just holding it down and it will play it back. This is a very short one, so it's just going to loop back. Um, but that's also a, a really nifty feature. If you press uh, arrow down once again, it's going to go back to just showing the thumbnails. So that's going to be the only thing that's showing there. Right, so um, other things that could be interesting to know is the um, the picture quality or the, the types of pictures you can select. So you can use just JPEGs, you can use raw pictures, you can have both. Um, and in fact, uh, you always get the raw pictures out of the camera. And you can do a video from within the camera. So that's the next thing I'm going to show how to make a, a video from, from the pictures you've shot. So when you have a um, time lapse scene like we have here, we go into the menu and all the way down to playback uh, menu, playback mode. So we go down here and we have time lapse video. We go in there. And the camera will automatically uh, look for time lapse sequences on the card. So we found this one here. And if we want to make a video for this, we press the menu button once. Now this men menu comes up here, it says time lapse video, rec quality is the first thing we can select. So I don't really see this very good on my screen here now. But you can actually go with the S series up to 10 bits and 50p. So let's say we want to have a 25p file in 8 bits or 10 bits maybe. There we go. And we set the, f sorry, set the frame rate here. And this is where you can um, do creative things. If you want to have a, a time lapse to be really smooth, you go, of course, 25 or 50 FPS. But you can also have it like a, a choppy motion, uh, kind of like a stop motion image. Uh, and the sequence setting here is if you want it to go forward or backwards. So you can reverse it in the playback. So when I hit OK here, it's, it says create time one minute. This is going to be much faster because it's only 14 <laughs> uh, images. If you have 500 ones or a thousand images, it could take longer. Um, but what I've found is that normally it, it, um, it's so much faster than doing any of this in your computer in the processing. It's probably Martin, 10 times faster. can you faster. hear me now? I was yeah, uh, I hear you. gone for a while. All right. <laughs> uh, cool. One thing to remember about this is if you have an S1H and you have the camera set to 24 hertz or cinema, uh, this will not work. Then you have to right. switch the camera to PAL or NTSC to combine the pictures. Yes, that's correct. And also some of the features like 10 bits is going to be different between models as well. But the S1H is the absolute flagship here. So if you're looking at a camera that will master time lapse like no other camera on the market, basically, uh, you have the S1H. It's, this, it's a fantastic camera to capture high resolution 24 megapixel stills for time lapses. And of course, the S1R 
is also very interesting because of the resolution of 47 megapixels if you can process it um, on, on the computer. So when do I want to process things in the camera and when do I want to do it uh, in post? That depends on your project, of course. If you have a, a very professional project that you um, want to squeeze every little bit out of it, uh, then go ahead with the raw pictures in your setup in Lightroom, for instance. Um, but also, the internal processing for creating a video is fantastic when you work with time lapse in any scenario, because you always want to have a preview. And I'm doing this a lot of times uh, when I shoot time lapses. I just start doing this, and I sometimes put the camera into the bag, and it comes up with the finished video in like five minutes or four minutes, three minutes, depending on how many thousand pictures there is. Um, and if you do it in computer, it's maybe 30 minutes to do the same job. So um, we did talk about the um, uh, exposure leveling thing and also yeah. the what what gradual... else should I think about when doing a time lapse yeah something that's really important I think is um, subject movement how does it look when I play it back so you need to kind of think in reverse right how do you want the, the first thing to think about is how do I want it to look when I play it back so the way I would normally start thinking is first question is how many pictures should I get or take so to think about that you need to first know how many seconds of video you want to have in post so let's say you want to have 10 seconds and we want to have 25 frames per second it's quite easy to calculate that you need 250 pictures but with the little tip that I came with earlier set it to 500 or 1000 pictures because it always going to happen something on the 251 frame so um, there's a balloon coming up on the sky or something just something happens so you want to be ready for it um, but also uh, it's important to think about the um, the kind of staccato look that you will get from two sharp images. So um, if we think in terms of um, motion blur, and we talked about this in an earlier episode about uh, creating videos and um, setting your shutter angle or your shutter speed. So if we think in 180 degree terms that we normally do in video, that means if you shoot an, a one second interval time lapse, the optimal uh, motion blur would be with about half second exposure, which brings up uh, the need for an ND filter, especially if you shoot at daytime. But you don't always need to have that shutter speed. Sometimes it's not convenient to do it. Uh, sometimes you want to have that kind of staccato effect. It depends specifically on, on your creative um, thinking at what you want to get. So blur effect and shutter speed and not making it look choppy, that's one thing to just consider as a very important thing for, your, for the look of your time lapse. I'm also thinking a bit about uh, your field of view. Say that you are shooting yeah. a plant and want to make a time lapse out of that. That plant might move around as it's growing. And yes. if you have too short a field of view, you might get into yeah. trouble. Yeah, so uh, when you set your focusing, uh, just like you said, it's, it's important to think about what will happen in time. Will this flower be in focus after three days? <laughs> maybe not. So maybe you need to have a, a f-stop at... 36 or 22 or something on a macro, for instance, to get your uh, depth of field right. Um, I used to think that the best mode to shoot is aperture priority in terms of exposure modes, because the camera uh, will want to have the aperture set already, and you want, obviously want to have it in, in aperture priority to, to have control over your depth of field. 
And the other parameters is quite easy for the camera to control, like the ISO is very stepless and the uh, shutter speed, either in mechanical or electronic, is very uh, easy to control for the camera. You can have automatic ISO, that works great. Um, and now I'm going to show just a little example of what this uh, mystical way that I, I, I talked about earlier in the menu that you can uh, uh, remove your interval setting. I forgot to show what that looks like. So I can show you here what it looks like in the menu, in the setting, if you do that. So if I turn shooting interval setting off, what happens is that there is no interval timer anymore. It's gone. There's only the image count. That's the only thing you can set now. So what happens if you do that? What kind of effect will it have? And why do we have that in the camera already? Uh, sometimes you want to go from day to night and you want to have a gradual kind of um, uh, speed flow. So at night things are very slow. Uh, the stars are uh, moving very slowly or the Earth is rotating slowly. <laughs> um, and at daytime you have maybe cars driving around in, in the streets and it's going to be much faster everything. So then you want shorter intervals. And the camera is going to do this automatically. So it's going to just gradually change the, um, the interval with your exposure. So what it looks like is something like this. This is a, a, an example I shot with the S1 when it came out. Uh, and you can see the shutter speed here at the bottom, how it's changing. Now, of course, it's not changing exactly like this, like 1.6, 2.0 seconds, because that's going to be flickering. So it's doing this in, in micro adjustments. So what I'm showing here is just the exif value that is rounded to the closest f-stop. So what happens is it's looping here. Uh, at the beginning, it's very much flow on the water. Uh, and it's early morning, it's quite dark, and then it's becoming morning, daytime, and it's going to be more kind of choppy water effect with the shorter uh, shutter speeds. Interesting, isn't it, Sebastian? There's yeah. a lot of things you can set in, in these cameras to get it right. There's a so, lot of course, that's up, also going to be. But it's quite yeah. simple with the. Uh, uh, the Lumix cameras to get it right and uh, yeah. the fact that you don't need a lot of extra stuff is really really nice just a small tripod is, yeah. and a compact camera and you're ready to go absolutely and if you're doing so, uh, stop motion for example you can connect your phone as a remote so you don't accidentally yeah. push around the camera when you um, take the exposure right Another, you had um, something about the fisheye, Martin. That I'm yeah, the fisheye. That's right. Yeah, great. Of. Yeah, yeah. I was, <laughs> I was just gonna uh, fall out of my memory that that stuff. So, when you use a fisheye lens, uh, you can use a software in post production that will straighten the image. And the really fantastic thing about this is, if you have um, a fisheye lens on, and you do the stretching uh, the correction of that lens in post, you can set your focal length. And you can even zoom in progressively. Oh, so that is great. really fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, a great software for this. I haven't used that in a long time. So I'm not sure if that's updated or if it's even uh, being developed anymore. But it, there's there was a, a software called Panelapse 360 that I used for for a moment, uh, I used it very much, <laughs> and I was doing some um, some short videos with this, uh, where I just had a small Lumix GM1, very small camera. I shot with not a fisheye at the time; I had a 24 millimeter. Um, I shot with the kit lens, and just kind of zoomed in on different subjects. So I can show for inspiration here a short little video where I was uh, I was bored, and I was at the the Stockholm. Uh, train station. I was waiting for a train that was delayed quite a lot. So I used the GM1 and um, ND filter, uh, a 10-stop 
ND filter, I think it was. And that, that was it. Uh, so I shot everything with one battery on the GM1. I think it was like 2,000 images, something like that. So there we go. Just sit back and relax. So that was actually shot with just um, single um, camera mounts. I had a, a very small little ball head uh, and a nano clamp, so I could just clamp it to, um, to railings and, and stuff in, in there, in the central station. Uh, and I didn't have any sliders, I had just <laughs> the camera in my pocket. Uh, and also <laughs> there's, there's one little, afterwards at least, it was a funny little incident in there that's could be go to, good to know sometimes when you shoot time lapse, especially um, after the um, the GDPR uh, uh, law came into effect. That uh, you need to be aware of where you are shooting with your camera is kind of like a, can be like um, issues with that. But also when I was shooting this one, uh, I think about security. <laughs> Uh, because I was approached by quite a lot of young men who were kind of just standing in a circle around me and I was feeling very small in there uh, because they just didn't want to be on picture. <laughs> and uh, I don't know what they had done or whatever, but I was standing there and I was like defending myself and uh, in a way that just talking myself out of it. And they were like, uh, so what did you take pictures of? <laughs> I was just doing a, a, a video, you know, it looks really cool, look here. Uh, I didn't photograph you guys, show us. So anyway, I talked myself out of it, but could be quite dangerous. So anyway. Um, so do so, we uh, have any questions in chat about time lapse in general? Let's see. Yeah, we'll see. Um, while we wait for that, we can uh, show a little bit more of inspiration here. Uh, projects that you can do at home when you're locked down in your home and you have a lot of time to spare. Uh, I think something that's really uh, interesting to, to try out is to capture flowers when they bloom. Or decay. That's also something that's quite nice to, to look, at, look at flowers that decay over time. <laughs> so uh, I shot this um, I think about, it was about a year ago, um, a short video with just um, this, don't recall the name of the flowers, but um, a flower that's very common during um, Christmas. So uh, I think I shot this in about five days, four or five days. I had a constant light and I think it was shot with three cameras. So I had macro lens and I had a, a more wide shot. It's a very short thing, but... So, while waiting for questions, we'll just shoot this out here. Oops, sorry, I'm gonna uh, put this from the beginning instead. 
So let's do it like this. Oh, sorry, it's not going to be from the beginning, but it's going to loop. So anyway. So we're going to start it from the beginning here just to see how it looks from the start. Like you could see here uh, in that video sequence that it was rotating and quite a lot of motion in there. So what I did was just I shot at full resolution and I created 4K previews in camera like we did earlier. And I just took those images and I uh, edited the video in, in 1080 in HD so I could actually rotate the picture a full 360. Um, so I took these different shots from the two or three cameras and just kind of mixed them in there. So uh, there were no sliders involved in, in this? Thing. Nothing. It was just standing there statically. Uh, and I think I had a 30 millimeter macro on uh, a G9. I had a GX8 camera, I think that was. I don't remember exactly. It was two years ago, I recall now. Um, but it, some things are really interesting to, to follow and see how the depth of field is, uh, is affecting it. And uh, the interesting thing with shooting these kind of long-term projects with a few days even, or longer time, is that you need to really get your brain going <laughs> before doing it. And that can be exciting. Good for your brain too. So I think we had some, um, some writings here in the comments. Uh, do you do the sliding effects with a slider or a setting in the camera? So, yeah, the uh, the sliding effects and the rotation and everything, that's only done in post. So it has nothing with the camera to do at all. I um, When I set up the time lapse, I, I think about how it will look at the widest and how much I want to zoom it in. And how much I can zoom in, it depends on the resolution only. So if you have 4K, you can most of the time zoom in like 200% or even I think it's 400% with HD in the editing and slides and, and you can do a lot of like uh, lens distortions and things as well so you can kind of if you have a, a super wide angle you can have this kind of um, tilting effect for instance on buildings you can do that in post with this Panolapse 360 software I think I use this one for this one as well um, yeah, okay. so that's just just one idea of little projects that you use your imagination, just see what you can do. It's and fun. just try it. I mean, uh, at this point, a memory card, it doesn't cost you that much. So if you need some extra space, buy another memory card. It doesn't need to be super quick or anything. Yeah. Just a big one and try it out. And also, uh, if you want to shoot raw pictures or not, don't think about it too much. I mean, if, you, if you're not sure if you want to have the raw pictures in post, shoot raw in JPEGs. It's always the best idea. Um, because you can always delete the, uh, the raw files afterwards. That's easy. So consider just shooting raw and JPEGs. 
It's always good to have a JPEG in there as well because you can easily use that in your computer in your editing software, for instance. Um, so I think we covered pretty much of the thoughts we had on this before this. You, uh, yes. We will also, yeah, this was quite a long episode, um, but we will also dedicate one episode for stop motion later on. So stay tuned for that later on. Um, that's going to be quite a ex special episode because then I'm going to shoot stop motion during that episode. So. Yes, and we also have a ambassador who specializes in uh, time lapse uh, called right. Morten right. Drustad, and we will have an interview up on the channel with him uh, later He's this really week. really great. And yeah. if you want to see some really great time lapse photography, go to his channel. Yeah, that's just something we, we couldn't talk about it enough. Uh, he's, he's really great at shooting time lapses and very famous for it as well. So we're happy to have him on board. Yeah. All right, Sebastian. So um, I think it's time to wrap it up there. If we don't have any more. We tried this, out having um, some technical issues and uh, getting yes. lost a bit, but uh, I think it went well. Yeah, we hope for the video audio sync to be at least uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, okay, um, so we have this last question here. Do you have any tutorials on how to do the editing for time lapses? That's a very good question. Uh, we don't have anything planned for it yet, but of course that's something we can consider doing. Yeah, it's a good uh, idea least, to make a small video. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can we can do it. Uh, you can write here if you want to have uh, uh, a advanced tutorial and a simple, or if we should. Um, just go with the simple. So we'll see what we um, could come up with. Thanks and a lot for the question. Time to do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. So um, thanks all for watching um, for this long episode today, and just uh, hoping you will get a great week and see you next time. Oh, uh, one last thing here. Yes, it would be interesting to see a small video on the basics on how to get started. Yeah, that's that's what I thought was going to be the easiest to do, just how to get the, the footage in there and how to make some easy slides and stuff. So we can uh, we can do that for probably easiest to do it in Final Cut Pro. Um, it's going to work out pretty much the same in, in different softwares as well. All right, thanks a lot for watching, guys and girls, and um, talk to you later. Cheers. Bye.